Well, why don't we get started? Uh, let me begin the program. And let me begin by welcoming everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. Uh, we have a fantastic guest and an absolutely essential subject uh, with a lot to cover, and I'm so looking forward to it. This is now my pleasure to welcome Jeff Salingo. Um, Jeff is a longtime journalist who has kept a keen eye and a sharp pen on higher education and where it's going. He's the author of multiple, multiple books that are very, very important reading, constantly writing important articles. His Twitter feed is essential. Um, now what we're bringing him on stage to talk about is his most recent book. Uh, and this is a book about admissions and college admissions called Who Gets In and Why. If you'd like to learn more about the book, on the bottom left of your screen, you should see a kind of a yellow tan colored lozenge. And if you press that, you'll get a chance to uh, grab a copy yourself. Uh, so Jeff, welcome to the forum. Welcome back. Uh, it's great to be back, Brian. And uh, I love the keen eye and sharp pen description. I might uh, I might use that. Oh, I'll keep that. Uh, <laughs> I'll credit you. Please do. Please do. Uh, first things first, uh, are you well, safe and sound? Everybody okay? Uh, I, I am safe and sound. Like many people, I have not been on a plane since March 7th. Uh, I was coming back from uh, from Texas, uh, where I hosted a dinner with some uh, college officials down in Texas and haven't been on a plane since. But uh, but the kids are back in school a couple days a week, and uh, it's just been oh, great wow. to spend time with the family. Oh, nice. Nice all around. Uh, well, I'm glad to hear all of that. And and where are you based now? Where are you DC, okay? not far from you. But it doesn't matter. We can't see each other. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you're safe, and uh, i got to say that I think for both of us, not flying out of Dulles every three days is probably a good thing. <laughs> Especially uh, on United, but uh, uh, yeah. I can't say anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's quite, quite true. Um, you know, when, I, when I ask people to introduce themselves, I, I, I don't go by the usual academic routine of saying, you know, tell us about your education and your projects. What I like to do is ask you to look forward a bit. Uh, and ask, what are you going to be working on for the next uh, academic year? What are the big topics or the big projects uppermost in your mind? Um, so the big pro projects for me are really going to be around what is higher education going to look like uh, post-COVID? Um, and what are the people, process, uh, talent, processes, and technology that is going to be necessary to enable that. I, I moderated a panel yesterday uh, at uh, the Milken Global Institute with Michael Crow and with uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Paul from Paul Quinn, Michael Sorrell, uh, with Carol Christ from uh, from Berkeley. Um, and so we talked a lot about what is the changes that our higher education is going through right now and what will it mean post COVID. So I think we're I think everyone's writing about what's happening in the moment, and I'm going to start to work on what's happening after this moment. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll need to bring you back. Yeah. As, as you make progress on this. Do you, have a, do you have a title for this book in mind? Oh, it's not a book yet. Uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing for the next book. The next book, I, you know, I've written three books about higher education uh, and I might want to do something outside of education. Uh, so if I did another book, it would probably be outside of higher education. All right, well, I'm still interested. I'm still definitely, definitely interested. Um, and I think we all are. Um, the uh, well, that sounds like essential, essential work to be done, um, and I, I hope we can uh, learn more from it, whatever form it takes. Um, now, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, the way this works is I usually begin with uh, uh, an opening question to get uh, our wonderful guest talking about his work, um, and then it's your turn to come in. I'm not going to be the interrogator, I'm not going to be the interviewer, I'm just the moderator. This is a platform for you. So if you have questions, if you have comments or thoughts, again, just use that either the question mark box or use the raised hand button uh, to ask more. And I promise I'll be nice. And I think Jeff will be nice most of the time too. We'll see, we'll see how that turns out. Uh, my first question for you, I just have to ask, um, and this is a, a kind of uh, obvious question in some way. You've been, you've been writing on higher education for 20 years which is kind of outlandish to think. Yeah, 23, actually, but yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, so when you did this in-depth dive into admissions, what changed over that nearly one generation? What, what surprised you that was new? Um, a lot has changed, actually. And, and to be honest with you, you know, I spent 16 years at the Chronicle of Higher Ed, and admissions was probably one of the only things I didn't cover uh, oh. when I was there. So, uh, so you know, 
writing about colleges over the last couple of years and other venues, whether the Atlantic or the Post or wherever, um, I would always get inundated with uh, notes, mostly from parents who wanted to know why is college admissions uh, such a black box, um, particularly at selective colleges, and uh, and why is it so different, or why do we perceive it to be so different than when we went to uh, to college? And I think there are there are three quick pieces here that I want to talk about about what has changed in in twenty plus years. And you know, I I went to college in the early nineteen nineties, and what has changed since then? Or Jack Steinberg, as many people know, a former higher ed reporter for the New York Times. Uh, did a similar book 20 years ago called The Gatekeepers, where he spent a year inside the process at at Wesleyan. And, and before I, I even pitched this book, I, I reread that book and realized how much it has changed. And there's probably three big pieces that have changed. Uh, and again, we're, we're largely talking about, and I keep reminding parents of this, thousands of colleges out there, average acceptance rate is 65%. Uh, what I'm talking about here is, you know, the schools that unfortunately, unfortunately, I think sometimes occupy way too much of our, our breath every day. And that's 200 or so most selective schools that uh, accept fewer than 50 percent of students who, who, who apply. But um, but three things I think have changed. Uh, one is that uh, higher education institutions have become more nationalized, a set of them have become more nationalized and internationalized. So we're back in even as late as the 80s, uh, as any of us know, right, uh, going to school from New York to California was seen as going literally across the, the country. Uh, it was it was much harder to fly. We didn't have you know the discount airlines, uh, right. obviously much harder to fly now. Uh, you know, we didn't have uh, technology like this. We had a lineup at the payphone uh, in the hallway and a residence hall to call home. So it just seems so much further away. And what has happened over the last couple of decades is that not only at the national scale, but an in international scale now, you have people now applying to especially these big brand name schools from all over the place. So suddenly now you have uh, the most talented students coming from Buffalo and going to California. And, and they're all pl playing in the, the same pool at a, a small number of schools. So that's the, the first big uh, change. The second big change is the, the rise not only of the Common App, which obviously started back in the 1970s, but then the idea that you literally could press a button and, and apply to multiple schools. So now, you know, average student is applying to eight, nine, 10 schools where I don't know what it was like, Brian, when you were applying, but I know I had to type them out on a typewriter, put them in the mail, and I didn't really want to do two or three. I didn't want to do more than two or three <laughs> back uh, back then. Okay. And then I think the third piece here is something that's happening in society in general, um, and that's we think uh, opportunity is increasingly scarce. Uh, and when that happens, we tend to kind of husband our resources uh, and keep them close to us. And I think for a subset of parents out there, largely parents who are in a certain income bracket in certain urban areas and suburban areas, uh, they want to pull out all the stops for their kids. And they think that uh, ending up on the right side of the economic divide means going to the most selective college you can get into, and thus they're going to do everything they can in their power to enable that to happen. And we saw in the Varsity Blue scandal, even willing to go to jail to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are great. Those are huge changes. I, I and and they mark. I went to college in the late '80s, and so that that definitely um, um, just very different. Yep. Yeah, you know, but I've seen as well. Uh, we have. Um, no, I, I think those are three major, major changes, especially that last one, which tugs in so many questions of credentialing and professionalization yep. and quality. Uh, we have a, a first question already out of the box. Wow. My gosh, I haven't even had a chance to ask people to do it again. Um, we have a question. This is from um, Rick Bryant to the University of Florida, who asks, is the time of legacy admissions coming to an end? And is there a difference between public and private institutions there? Um, I, I'm assuming the second uh, part of the question is related to the first one. Um, yes, I think that uh, for a certain set of institutions, legacies are becoming um, uh, more difficult to defend uh, based on our discussions about equity um, in admissions, particularly when it comes to uh, low-income students, first-generation students, students of color, right? All students who are really locked out of a system that is largely built on 
legacy missions. The other thing is that I am starting to see at some schools, not all schools, that they're getting better data around this and they're starting to find that maybe legacy doesn't matter as much as we thought it did, right? We know there is national research data on legacy doesn't necessarily bring the dollars that we thought it did, right? We thought it helped in development. But I know that another reason why many schools use legacy is around yield. They think those students are going to actually enroll. Not only do you admit them, but they're actually going to enroll because of that connection they have to uh, to the school. And, and some schools, I still think that's very true, uh, but others, you know, so for example, one of the schools that I followed was Davidson uh, yep. College. Uh, and I talk a lot in the book about how legacy mattered to their likelihood to enroll of students that they uh, admit it, um, they're actually reducing that uh, in the in the coming years because they didn't see it giving as much of a, a you know as much help as they thought it would have in terms of uh, in terms of enrollment. So we're starting to see that more and more uh, across colleges and universities. Well, this is a, a fantastic question and uh, a very very important one. And uh, Jeff, that's a very uh, very precise and, and rich answer. Uh, we have, thank you. We have a, a question that comes from uh, Wisconsin, from Michael Johnson, uh, and he emailed me this, he can't make it right now, but asks, uh, what do you think about credit portability in admissions now? Uh, how is that changing? Meaning credit, I'm assuming portability between institutions. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's going to be, in my mind, it has to become more critical, especially during this pandemic, right? Because we're seeing, you know, we just saw the new numbers uh, today around enrollments. Uh, clearly, uh, students are making slightly different choices than they normally would have made uh, outside of the of the pandemic. Uh, we have students taking some time off. We have students going to institutions closer to home. Uh, and we may have uh, students who may be transferring institutions after that. Not quite sure what's happening in the community college market yet because those numbers really kind of, I don't know what you think, Brian, but those numbers kind of confuse sure. me because they're just so, they're so far down and it's so counterintuitive than what normally happens mm -hmm. in, uh, in, a, in a recession. So I hope somebody's digging a little bit deeper into what's really happening there because my assumption would have been, including traditional 18 year olds would have started at community colleges this fall because they wanted to stay at home less expensive and, and so forth. So credit portability is gonna become even more critical, I think, um, in, the, in the future years. And, it, and it's something that I saw parents and students, particularly coming out of high school, don't think about. Because when you bring it up to them, as they think about, well, I'll start here and move here and I could always transfer and things like that. And I always ask, well, are you sure your credits are gonna transfer? And they say, well, what do you mean? Why wouldn't they? So I think there's this idea that we, uh, that this is yet another uh, piece of the higher education system that the average person in public doesn't uh, doesn't understand. Has no connection to it all. Uh, uh, friends, Jeff and I were talking about this um, new report that came out this morning from the uh, National Student Clearinghouse Center. Um, and uh, I did a blog post about it this morning, so you can go there. I just put a little link to it in the chat box, but uh, a key feature of it uh, is not only is overall enrollment down about 3%, uh, but the community colleges were especially hammered. I mean, a drop of something like 12 to 16%. Yeah, yeah I, and again, a number, Brian, I know you've done a lot more on this, just doesn't, doesn't quite make sense to me. Uh, I, I think there, there are a few explanations. One, uh, Tom Hames, who uh, works at the community college, point out technology issues uh, where uh, community colleges are under-resourced as are a, a preponderance of their students. Uh, a second is I think that so many community college classes involve hands-on work, you know, everything from culinary arts and diesel and medical print. Uh, but I think also one of the surprises of that uh, report was that they're losing ground to for profits. Uh, for profits actually increased, and so I think to some extent for profits are are eating their lunch, um, which is uh, something that we need to track. Um, we have more. Thank you for answering that. Um, uh, Michael is a great guest and a and a great participant. We have more questions just coming in like mad. And friends, if you'd like to join us on stage again, just press that uh, raised hand. And uh, and if you don't, I may just beam you up anyway. Let's see what happens. <laughs> um, so we have from David Stone at the University of Michigan. Will the budget impact of COVID nineteen further reduce state funding for higher education? Is higher education funding a priority within the state budgets at this time? Sorry, that's not so much an admissions question. No, uh, but uh, you know, I got my start at the Chronicle of Higher Education as a state reporter, so uh, I, I, I find I fancy myself a little bit of an expert on state funding of, of higher education. And 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 
first of all, higher education has never been a priority in, in state budgets for a very long time. It's always been the balance wheel of most state budgets because it's, um, you know, you can't really charge, pr uh, you know, prisoners tuition, uh, you know, public education, public K through 12 education, uh, you can't charge tuition. So, you know, it was always the balance wheel because they knew they can always raise tuition uh, for uh, students in, in at public colleges and in universities. And that's exactly what's been happening, right? More than in more than half the states today, uh, students pay a, a bigger share of the budget or a bigger share of their tuition than than the state does. And and I don't see, unfortunately, that getting better um, in this in this pandemic. And one other thing that I worry about is that uh, public universities in particular have balanced uh, or have helped their revenue stream in recent years by going out of state and out of country. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, international enrollment at public universities at, at some flagship publics, uh, out of state freshmen actually outnumbered in state freshmen uh, because again, they wanted that that bigger revenue uh, that they were getting from out of state students and, and international students. And both of those numbers, you know, we know what's happening with international students, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, again, from the National Student Clearinghouse report today, but also on top of that, uh, you know, I think that one impact of this pandemic is that students are going to be staying closer to home, looking for better deals in state. Uh, you know, I have uh, uh, I have somebody I know uh, who uh, lives in New Jersey and goes to the University of Maryland. Uh, and I asked them, you know, I asked this parent, I said, why wouldn't you just go to Rutgers? Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think you're gonna start to see more of that, right? You're gonna start to see more of those uh, students who are leaving uh, the state start to say, well, why wouldn't I just go to my state flagship or my state regional public? Uh, makes sense. That makes sense. Um, that's a that's a really, really solid answer. Um, and we have more questions just piling in. Ah, this is this is great. Um, you just unlocked a, t a storm here, uh, Jeff. Uh, and this is uh, this is from Joel Bloom at CUNY at Hunter College, who asks, how do you expect schools that have shifted to test optional to use test scores from students who do submit them? It's a great question. Um, and I will tell you, I, I wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago for The Atlantic because what I was seeing was that, you know, we know uh, from fair tests that more than 500 colleges now have gone test optional for this year because, or at least this year, in some cases, three years, some cases permanently, because um, the pandemic has made it almost impossible or very difficult for students to take uh, the SAT or ACT. And the story that I did for, um, for the Atlantic a couple of weeks ago was how students were and parents were going crazy to try to find a testing site. Uh, so they would drive hours. Some people would gasp it, even get on a plane to go take the SAT and ACT. And I kept asking, well, why would you do that if you're going to apply to a test optional school? And most uh, there's still a, a large and this goes back to, I think, the trust in higher education and trust in institutions right now. They just don't believe this about colleges and universities. They say, well, colleges and universities say they're test optional. We don't believe it. Uh, and uh, and so again, it goes back to, I think, trust in higher education overall right now. Uh, given the pandemic, I think higher ed has taken a big hit uh, in the media. Brian, you you see this a lot, right? The the, the amount of uh, coverage now of higher education, and, and to be honest with you, not much of it is, is positive. So I think that what's going to happen is, and I keep telling parents and students, if, if you don't trust it, this is the year to trust it. Uh, because in so many of these institutions, you know, in an average weekend now, the SAT is canceling about half of uh, the test uh, registrations because they can't give cool. those tests. So there are going to be so many students this year not able to submit a test score. So even at selective colleges that might have been test optional and maybe 85% in a normal year still submitted scores, you might only have 50%. Uh, similar. So you might have, you know, and colleges can't pick their class only on half their pool, right? They have to look at that other half. So the question was, well, what will you do without test scores or how, I think the question was actually was, how will you use test scores? And I don't, I don't think they'll use them any differently than they used them in the past. And to be honest with you, after spending this year in college admissions, one of the things I found is that parents and students are much more in love with these tests than anybody in an admissions office, <laughs> uh, right? They, admissions offices, at least at the schools that I was at and, and, and many others I talked with, really use them as kind of a check against something else that might not make sense in the student transcript, whether it's a, you know, maybe they didn't take enough 
uh, college prep courses or enough uh, rigorous courses, or maybe the grades were a little bit off or they're all over the place and they wanted to take a, they wanted to figure out what's going on with the student and the, and the test score kind of provided a little bit of a counterbalance comparison that they could uh, use, or maybe they didn't know the high school well, right? I talk a lot in the book about how high schools matter, where they're recruiting students from, where these students are coming from. And maybe they didn't know the high school, they didn't know how rigorous the grading system was. And so they would use the test score in that way. And I think they're gonna use the same, if they have that test score this year, uh, and there's something they don't quite get on the uh, on the transcript, they'll use the test score, I think, in, in the same way. Well, that, that's a really, really rich answer. Um, and uh, uh, Joel, thank you for the for the question, which give, gives us a, a kind of deep cut into uh, where higher education is working in general, uh, not just admissions. Uh, we have a video question from Steve at Campus Sonar. Let me see if I can bring him on stage. Let's see. I think we're there. Look at that. I figure somebody has to be the guinea pig here. That's you, Steve. Welcome. Well, thank you for the opportunity to come up here. Uh, and Jeff, thank you for the book. Uh, no I'll admit, I'm only in the reading section. So so maybe this hasn't, uh, the question I'm going to ask is something you'll explain later in the book. But in the introduction, the one that you write specifically to students and their parents, you recommend that they don't fret about visiting colleges and instead your research schools on platforms like Reddit and YouTube in particular. I'm curious in the conversations that you had in putting this book together, what sense did you get from college administrators that they're aware that students can and are researching them on these platforms that you mentioned? And are they concerned at what those prospective and admitted students might find when they're doing their research on those platforms? Yeah. Uh, so, Steve, thank you. Um, and by the way, I don't. I don't think I only recommended that they that they look there, but they are looking there. So, this bay, this is the reality. And I suggested it as yet another thing they could be looking at. Um, so, they are going beyond the normal channels, and this is nothing new. I mean, ever since the rise of the internet, uh, college is no longer governed kind of the the marketing that students got to see, right? Think back in the old days, and I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the history of direct marketing in, in higher ed. They really controlled that channel and they don't anymore. And so in answer to your question, I there's there are some college officials, I do know some people in admissions offices where they're savvy enough, that person's usually also monitoring social media, they're monitoring YouTube, they're monitoring Reddit, College Confidential, all those things. So they are aware of it and they do have something monitoring it and responding in real time. And in fact, in Reddit forums, you will see sometimes college officials replying to things, but that's a tiny fraction of, of, of what's out there. And it is amazing the amount of content uh, around college admissions on, on Reddit and YouTube. And by the way, many of them, many of the YouTube stars, in fact, I was just interviewed by one who has, you know, 50, 60,000 you know, and at and many colleges, like their top YouTube person will be, you know, 50, 60,000 uh, uh, followers or whatever they call them on YouTube. Uh, and, um, and you know, these are people advertising that college for them. And, and I wish that college leaders would understand that's what's happening. Well, thank you. Thank you, Steve, uh, for the really nice question. Um, and uh, thank you, Jeff, again, for the, for the perfect answer. Um, we have a, uh, so if you're new to the forum, it is just that easy to get up on stage. And in fact, here, uh, if you'd like, if it's too complicated to ask me, just press the teal color box and you'll be up on stage. Um, and if you do it by mistake, it'll be, it'll be entertaining, um, but it's, uh, it's very good to see and hear uh, all of you. Uh, we had another question that came in um, from, uh, actually another from the Washington DC area. This came by email ahead of time. I wanna make sure we got this in. Um, What's going to happen if COVID is not, if, if COVID means that grades are not an accurate measurement of academic potential? Uh, you know, students don't have access to the same amount of uh, jobs and curricular activities. We have all kinds of questions about, about uh, assessment and, you know, shifting to pass fail and that kind of thing. I mean, what is COVID doing to, uh, to the whole admissions process? Yeah, and I think that's Brian, and and I just wrote a piece in the in the Washington Post that I could I could add uh, to your to your list of resources uh, about. I think that's where colleges, again, more selective colleges that have this ability, 
because they're inundated with applications. I think that's where they're going to lean into high schools. They know. Um, and this was really a big piece of this ended up being a much bigger piece of the book than I thought, uh, oh. where where high schools really matter, um, not only where colleges and universities recruit uh, oh. every year, where they get to know the counselors, uh, sometimes even by name, where during the uh, review process, they don't even have to look at the high school profile. So this is a document that comes with the application telling the admissions officer everything about that high school. Well, they know this high school so well, they don't even need to look at that high school profile. They know how many AP courses they offer. They know what the percentage of students who go to college are because every year they get a bunch of those uh, uh, students. So they feel so comfortable with those high schools because they take so many students from them every year. Yeah. I think what they're going to do this year is to say, you know what, instead of taking 10 from that high school, we'll take 12, we'll take 15. So all of these big feeder high schools that they already have, they're going to, uh, they're just going to lean more, more into in my, in my, uh, my opinion. Um, and in fact, um, I'm going to pull up a, a stat here uh, to talk about li a little bit more about why, um, sorry, I'm just going to pull up something from the, the book. Um, so when human capital research, which is an admissions consulting firm uh, that I, I use in the book as a character, they analyzed 130,000 applications, I'm, I'm quoting from the book here, oh. to a brand name college over the span of a decade. It found that just 18% of high schools were responsible for 75% of applications and 79% of admit, admitted students, 18% of high schools. We have 43,000 high schools in this country about public, private, small, large, rural, urban. Um, and, and, you know, so at a place like Emory, one of the universities I followed, maybe 8,000 high schools were represented in that admissions pool. But trust me, there were true feeder schools in that. And I think they're just going to, all these schools are going to lean more into those, into those feeder schools. 18% of high schools, I mean, less than a fifth. Yeah. Responsible for about. And, you know, and that's, that's one, one institution, but trust me, that is replicated over and over again. It's one of the reasons why, and I know you have written a lot about demographics. It's one of the reasons why many of these uh, colleges in the Northeast and in the Midwest are, are so stuck right now because they're so dependent on a small subset of high schools out there. Well, there's a way, there's a way to make that work. Um, and the uh, well, traditional way. And uh, David Holma from the Harvard Business School has a question about that which is about sports. What about the future of elite schools and sports recruiting? What direction might it take? And what about sports that are more niche? Squash, Nordic skiing, fencing. Uh, this is almost like the, uh, the, the question on uh, legacies. Uh, mm. uh, sports, and, and I, again, I dedicate a, a whole chapter to sports. Uh, and as Brian knows, I think he had a chance to look at the book, right? I, I, I you know, athletics, particularly at, elite selective division three schools in particular, you know, when we tend to think of sports and it's interesting, even the editor of my book, I had to rework this chapter very much during the editing process, because I think when the average American thinks about college sports, they think about what they see on TV and they think about two sports. Cool. Uh, they think about basketball and football cool. uh, for the most part, right? They now all, everybody in the, in, in the audience today who work at college and universities know, we're talking about a much bigger world here, but but most Americans, that's what they think about. But at the average college, we might have 23 to 25 sports, and we have to fill those roster spots. And at selective colleges, that's even more difficult because they also have to pass muster with the admissions office. Uh, and, and that's where at highly selective colleges, they have to reserve spots. So for example, almost all recruited athletes come in early decision. Uh, they reserve spots for many of these students. They have the slot system where there, there are seats dedicated for athletes and at places. And I focus a lot on Amherst in the book, mm -hmm. right? They are, they are not only dedicating spots, but they're, they're very explicit that those spots are for some of those spots are for students who might be under the traditional academic profile. So there is not only a thumb on the scale, there's a whole fist on the scale. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a huge sports fan. My, uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law actually coach athletics at a Division three college, right? I'm not. Uh, I've been getting into some Twitter debates, Brian, with um, including my 
kid's babysitter who was a college athlete herself about this. Like, you know, I'm not, I, you know, and I tell parents, you know, if you want to take this pathway into a college, go ahead and take it, but understand by the way, you're getting a preference too. Um, so don't complain about any other preference that somebody else might get uh, in the admissions, uh, in the admissions process. And, and at a place like Amherst, and let me just kind of uh, uh, end this because somebody brought, they brought up squash and these, um, these Olympic co uh, slash country club sports, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, that very few people and no offense to anybody who plays them, but very few people go to see, right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and they don't necessarily bring money in, but what they are bringing in are, uh, or money from people going to see them. They are bringing in a class of student and um, because they, uh, where they tend to be played, uh, they are bringing in maybe students from other parts of the country, uh, which are important to colleges and, uh, and universities, but they are bringing in largely affluent students who could pay at some of these colleges, pay the entire bill just to play their, play their sport. And I make that point at, um, at Amherst, which has been on a, uh, a, a strategy to try to diversify the student body but among their athletes who make up a third of their student body, a third of their student body, uh, more than 90% of their athletes are white and more than 90% come from the top income uh, quintile, well, right? So if you need to diversify your student body and a third is essentially off the table because they play athletics, you're going to have to do a lot of work with the rest of that applicant pool to pull in a lot of first generation, low income, underrepresented students. So yep. as I point out in the book, if you're a, essentially, if you're a white upper class, uh, you know, affluent student, you don't play sport, your chances of getting into a place like Amherst is, um, is not really good. And so we could talk about the fairness and unfairness and the supposed meritocracy of college admissions. But yep. that to me is a great example of how it isn't fair and it's not a meritocracy. David, that's a great question. I'm really, really glad you answered this or that you asked this rather. And Jeff, I'm really glad you answered it. This is something, uh, Anecdotally, my students are really, really keen on, and they're completely divided. They're on, they're on all. They, 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 it's, a, it's a hard, you know, it's, and it, Brian, I think it just comes back to this idea that we have come to think, especially at selective schools, that admissions is a zero sum game. Right. I got in and you didn't. Right. Well, the fact of the matter is, nine of you didn't get in because I got in, right? Oh. Um, and by the way, yes, colleges have priorities and they, to, um, they fulfill those priorities through admissions. And so they want more people from South Dakota. Yes, they want more African-American students. Yes, they want more low-income students. They want more men. They want more X major, whatever it might be. They want more full payers. So everybody in this process, not everybody, but most people in this process are preferenced in some way. And I think that, you know, before we start to argue in, in court about, who gets an advantage and who doesn't? I think we have to be pretty. Uh, I, I think we have to be pretty honest with ourselves about how this system works, and it isn't fair, and it is not a meritocracy. Whoa, that's quite a sting at the end. It is not fair, no. and it's not a meritocracy. Well, um, we'll just let that sink in for a second. Um, but then we also have um, a, a wonderful friend of the program that I wanted to bring on stage. Um, and this is Sarah uh, San Gregorio, um, who uh, is coming to us from the Northeast. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Hi, Sarah. can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Awesome. Um, my question's about graduate programs. So anecdotally, um, I'm in my mid thirties and uh, a bunch of my friends have all gone back to school uh, to get their graduate work since the pandemic. Are you starting to see things with uh, uh, the pandemic affecting uh, like an uptick in the graduate area as well as what you've been seeing in, in undergrad? Yeah, so my, my book only focuses on the undergraduate level, but because I you know cover uh, higher education more broadly, and I think Brian probably could add to this as well, but you know, in fact, the, the I believe, and I didn't dive into the uh, numbers from the clearinghouse today, Brian, but I know the the last time the the graduate numbers were up actually, right? The yeah. big the biggest way, which actually also surprises me because I thought that I mean graduate programs are expensive. Uh, you know the the huge amount of student loan debt is actually in the graduate area, not in the undergraduate area. When we look at those er uh, numbers, I really thought that it's not that I didn't think people would want to be upskilled or reskilled. 
uh, in this recession, but I thought that they might look for alternative types of programs. Um, and maybe we just kind of keep going back to what's tried and true, and that is the graduate programs, uh, the traditional graduate programs. And maybe we still think that the graduate degree, the master's degree, whatever it might be, still provides us that signal. It goes back to the signaling thing uh, for for the workforce. So, so yes, we are seeing that. I'm surprised by Sarah because Sarah, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I'm surprised by because I thought this would have been the moment where um, kind of alternatives, and I, what do I mean by that? Like certificates, other types of alternative credentials, the you know the, the stuff that Google's doing and everyone else is doing, MOOCs and everything else. I thought this might be the time when people would start to uh, flock to them instead of flocking to traditional uh, graduate programs. And maybe we're just early in this process right now. And maybe in six months or a year, we might see that. Uh, but I was, I was kind of surprised by those numbers. Thank you. Oh, that's a good You're question. Welcome. Thank you. And, um, and another really good answer, the, uh, the campus clearinghouse or the student clearinghouse data uh, had uh, an increase in graduate school enrollment, although it was less of an increase than they previously thought. And again, the, the super majority, something like 85% of that increase is in um, not in master's or PhD, but in graduate certificate programs. Oh, okay. So there we go. Uh, which is very actually might prove my point a little bit that we're they're not interested in full fledged degrees. Yeah, correct, correct. Which is where as I, where I think the future is going. Um, mm. In that, um, I think it's expensive. You know, full fledged graduate degrees are expensive, uh, and unless you have a specific return on investment of that, uh, I think that's where um, graduate education again that may not lead to a PhD in a faculty job or on the research side where I think kind of the professional master's programs are, are going to be moving. Well, thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions about graduate enrollment, but I think, uh, Brian, um, Bond, let me know if we address that. Um, you can follow up if you like with another question. Uh, we have a, another a long-term uh, friend of the program, Tom Haymes. I'm gonna see if I can ambush him and bring him on stage uh, from Texas. Yes, yes, it looks like we got him. Good afternoon. So. As a uh, yes, as a holder of two uh, graduate degrees in the liberal arts, I can say it's a proven money maker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, it's worth going into huge debt for. So um, I got out of my undergraduate with no debt whatsoever, uh, going to UT Austin, which was a stupendously good deal in the late '80s. Um, Oh, but that has nothing to do with my question. Um, so my question is going back to an earlier discussion about enrollments. And I know you do a lot of work with colleges around uh, adapting to new realities of education and so on and so forth. And I was wondering how much of the dip in enrollments do you uh, put down to colleges' unwillingness to um, be flexible on some of their systemic things, things like uh, standard length semesters, things like credit hours, things like degree programs, uh, completion, succession, uh, success, uh, success initiatives that, yeah. that tend to box students in and make them go, oh, wait a minute, I don't know sure I want to get into this. Um, it's kind of relates to my earlier point about community college students. Uh, I, you know, I think that there's a fair chunk of them who chose not to go to take classes this semester because they didn't feel like they could handle the tech aspects of it in the sense that they didn't have reliable Wi-Fi or a computer that they could work on and so on and so forth. And and uh, I made the observation in the chat uh, as well that um, uh, I have far fewer students. I teach at a community college. I have far fewer students that are um, tech uh, challenged this semester than I did in the spring um, because I think uh, the tech challenge the students did just find left. Yeah, they just chose not to sign up for classes. Yeah. So my question is, to what extent do you see colleges uh, being willing to bend in order to meet the circumstances around that? I think it's a very variable question, but I feel like a lot of colleges are leaving enrollment on the table because of the fact that they're not meeting the students where they are at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually been true even before the pandemic, right? That we, yeah, sure. That most institutions were unwilling to bend on those things. And in some ways, they did bend on them. I might, I might push back a little bit on kind of the academic calendar and obviously they went online on a dime. I think the biggest thing that they didn't bend on is tuition. Uh, mm. So it's interesting. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that I did a 
a panel with presidents at the Milken uh, Global Institute yesterday, and one of them was Tom mm -hmm. Thomas LeBlanc, uh, president of George Washington uh, University, uh, and he was talking about um, how they discounted tuition slightly uh, when they went online. I think he said 10%, but don't quote me on that. And I said to him, well, how did you come up with that number? And he said, well, it wasn't scientific. Uh, it was essentially what we can afford. Um, and I, you know, if you ask most students about their experiences in a, uh, either in a residential or face-to-face -face education, they will talk about the relationships. They will talk about the mentorships. They will talk about the peer learning. Uh, they will talk about all those things that are obviously not as present in a underdeveloped online experience. And we all know uh, on, on this, in this forum, uh, we know what good online education is and we know what bad online education is. And mm -hmm. much of what's happened since the spring in remote education has been on the bad side, I think. It, has, it just hasn't yes. taken advantage of the, of the technology. So where I, think mm -hmm. this, where I think this is coming down to is that parents and students are saying, yeah, you're giving me a 10% discount, but I actually think the, the on-campus experience is or the residential experience or the face-to-face -face experience is worth a lot more than 10%, uh, right? <laughs> I, I think it might be worth 50%. Um, so I think mm -hmm. where you left enrollment on the table and colleges, the model just doesn't provide this, is I think colleges should have been honest about, and they many colleges can't because they haven't even figured this out. Like how much is the in-person, in-classroom experience worth or how much does it cost? And then how much does all that mm -hmm. other stuff cost? Because if we're, if we're going online and we're taking away everything from the outside the classroom experience, that is worth a lot more than 10%. Uh, and right. that's where I think parents and students said, you know what, I'm just gonna take the year off. Uh, and I'm just not gonna pay any, you know, I'll pay whatever it is, maybe a, a fee that I have to be, to remain kind of currently associated with the university. So where I think maybe colleges left money on the table then is like, you know, well, how about you take one course, right? Uh, and, you know, you maybe do other stuff that kind of keeps you, uh, that's where I would have been more, that's where I would bend more if you can't offer them a 50% discount. Are there other things of value that you can give them uh, in mm -hmm. order to keep them associated with the college or university? Well, what about non-elite colleges though? Like, you know, again, like community colleges, we, you know, we were kind of scratching our head over the drops there. Um, I, I agree with you. I expected, I actually expected community college enrollments to go up because I figured some of the people who would otherwise go off to the public for your institutions would say, would have gone to community hey, colleges. I, and I, 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 I might as well sit at home and go to a community college yeah. and, and pay a third as much. Right? And, and, and where I think that, uh, and I agree with you, that's that I, I didn't see that happen by the way. I didn't see that happen either. And I expected that. And I think partially yeah. because, and I could tell you this when I, I talked to parents and students and counselors. They didn't even think of that as an option. So this is where I think kind of an underdeveloped recruitment process for community colleges, right? Mostly open enrollment institutions. You come to them. They don't come to you. Like, could you imagine if community colleges had a marketing effort in their, in their region that was, fo and maybe somebody did, I don't know, but was focused on like the class of 2020 and said, hey, yeah. you know, come here instead of, you know, going online to state university or come here and go online, you know, even if we can't meet in person, you know, they don't, they have underdeveloped marketing recruitment um, because of the types of institutions they are. I think if they did, they might've been able to grab some of those students. Yeah. Although I, I, I will push back a little bit and say that my college, uh, I mean, I'm at Houston community college. Okay. Uh, does advertise, does market pretty, spend a lot on marketing and advertising also because we're in a large urban area in competition with other community colleges like Lone Star that are uh, in San Jacinto, which are close by. Uh, but um, um, yeah, I just, you, you, you may be right. I, I mean, I, I mean that, that people simply didn't consider that as an option, but I just feel like stu colleges in general, including community colleges, and are not being flexible enough in meeting students where they are on a lot of these things and, and that they're missing huge opportunities both online and in person, whenever in person comes back because of that. So, and it's exacerbated by the pandemic. I just like the way your voice dropped when you said Lone Star. It was like, yeah, compares to yeah, Lone Star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Their enrollment didn't crater as bad as, as HCC's, which is interesting. Well, that is. Tom, thank you.
Thank you very much. That's a great question. Thanks. Uh, this is the part of the program where we uh, nudge our guests into thinking more and more about the future, if we haven't already been talking about that. Uh, and so now we've got a great question from a great friend of the program here, uh, from Raj, uh, coming to us from uh, SUNY Old Westchester, who, um, I'm sorry, Old Westbury, uh, who uh, asks, will you comment on the suitability, future, and sustainability of standardized tests, especially as they relate to underserved populations? Yeah, um, I think they're on their way out uh, uh, for the va for a, a much larger. You know, we already had over a thousand. I think it was like a thousand twelve hundred colleges that were already test optional before the pandemic. Add another five hundred or so that were added in more selective colleges that were added because of the pandemic. Some of them have said that they're doing three year uh, tests or three year pilots of that. Um, and I think they'll kind of study their data and they'll say, you know what? We admitted a class, they're doing as well as any of our other students in college, and we didn't have a test score for them. Why do we need one? Uh, I think you'll see the super selective colleges go back. I think you'll see some of the state flagships go back because there's political pressure. You know, we're even seeing that now, you know, it took Georgia, for example, forever uh, to go test optional because there was political pressure there. I think Florida still hasn't gone test optional. I moderated a panel at the NACAC, uh, all the admissions officers and counselors a couple weeks ago, and we had the president of UCF on there and he was getting bombarded with questions about why they haven't gone test optional. And it was really out of his hands because again, it's, a, it's usually a political calculation and in some of these states, and I'm not trying to get political here, but um, in some of these states, it's just really hard to go test optional from some of people in the standards movements who think that uh, testing is important. But I think we're gonna see a lot of colleges not uh, not go back. Now, what's gonna be interesting, Ryan, is that uh, I keep talking about this panel I moderated yesterday because it's oh, you know, great. my brain. Um, so next week, if I'm on, I'll remember the panel I moderated the day before. <laughs> but um, Carol Christ, the chancellor of Berkeley was on. And you know, California is involved in litigation now, the University of California had gone test optional, now they're test blind because of this litigation there. Oh. And she keeps saying, you know, this is not over yet, we're still going through this. She keeps talking about another test uh, oh. that measures, you know, actual learning rather than uh, kind of an achievement-based uh, test. Uh, I'm skeptical of that. And by the way, I'm not quite sure Raj is, you know, a lot of tests have issues obviously with equity and I'm not quite sure, um, you know, this idea of developing yet another test. Uh, I kind of wish that we would kind of reduce our reliance on testing in a lot of places. Um, and uh, so, but you know, that worried me yesterday when she said that, uh, that, uh, well, we might get do away with the SAT or ACT, but God, we're going to develop another test. And you know what happens when the University of California will develop something. And if they do develop something, then everybody else will follow them. So we're never going to get rid of testing that way. So um, anyway, that's uh, that's where I think it stands. That's a good answer. So she didn't have a specific test already in mind. It was one that she'd like to lead the development yeah, of. Yeah, they may lead the development of. They may use some of the, the K-12 testing, but anyway. Okay. Well, this is good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Raj, for the, for the very good question. Uh, Eric Stokes from the University of uh, Memphis had a, a related question, uh, which is the advocates argue against the use of tests with good intentions. Removal of tests will result in more subjective review. And could work contrary to intent. How do you think that will impact access and diversity? I mean, you, you kind of answered this just now, but I want to make sure that. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's a good question, and I think that you know, testing is is one of it. It reminds me of it reminds me of these uh, fights that you know we get into where you know mass versus non mass, going back to school versus non going back to school. I mean, people uh -huh. get into their camps. Uh -huh. Trust me, I've just spent two couple of years inside this process, and whenever you bring up testing. There are people protesting and anti-testing, and boy, they don't like each other. No. Um, and they will never cede any ground to the other side. Um, and so uh, one point about testing that I saw is that there are diamonds in the rough that college is fine, right? In fact, one of the kids I followed in the book was from rural Pennsylvania, went to high school where the average SAT score was 950. He hits it out of the park, 1300 plus. He ends up you know, going to a school he would have never gone to otherwise. Uh, I even saw that at the schools I was embedded in, right, where they found students, quote unquote, found students they would never have found without testing. So you take testing away, what happens yeah. to those students? Do you find them? Are you, even if you're not more subjective, but you're objective and still look at, at the high school grades and high school uh, uh, transcripts, you're going to say, well, you know, this kid went to high school where they don't offer any APs. We don't really trust it, you know, things like that. So it is going to be, I think it is going to have an impact on, on, on diversity. Uh, so 
and this is the problem with this testing debate is it is shades of gray. Um, and I, I wish there are elements of testing that we could save. This is a great answer. And, and we're running low on time. And I know you have a hard stop. And I want to make sure I get as much Jeff Slingle goodness out of this as possible. Um, I, I'd like to combine two questions and squish them together. Um, so these are because these are almost two parts of the same question here. Uh, th this is one from Terry Givens, who asks about tuition. So hold on to that for a second. And Terry is awesome. A great guest. So about tuition in this. And then Brian Bond adds to that the question of uh, scholarship models. So you know, looking ahead in admissions, how are we going to see the tuition scholarship model of, of processing and ingesting students change? Thanks to both Brian and Terry for a good question. Um, well, the pricing model, and Brian, I wish that somebody would, would really kind of lean into this. Um, we need to develop a new pricing model in higher ed. I mean, this idea of high tuition, high aid, if you look at the budgets, uh, really get inside the budgets, which I've been able to do at a, a number of colleges that have been continuing to discount year after year, you will see, if you look at the last 10 years of their net tuition revenue, you will see this or this. Yeah. Um, they are just not bringing in enough revenue um, in order to really sustain their operations or invest in new things, right? So, and yet every year they're continuing to raise their tuition um, because they have to raise their discount rate and they're just not bringing in any new real dollars. So that's just, it's not sustainable. And so, you know, a couple of years ago, colleges started to um, kind of do tuition resets, mm -hmm. right? Where they just basically drop their uh, uh, tuition uh, or their published tuition down to what their discounted price was to anywhere. I think that, uh, uh, you know, I haven't seen more recent studies on it, but I think in most cases it helped for a year or two, but it really didn't change the trajectory of those schools. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I really hope that coming out of this pandemic, some smart economist out there, some smart CFO comes up with a whole new pricing model uh, for higher education. And I think part of it is we have to get our costs under control as well. So um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. That's good. About 10 years ago, I had this uh, epiphany where I was trying to figure out how to explain higher ed pricing to uh, people not in higher ed. And I realized that the closest analogy was really American healthcare. And then I thought, oh man, we're in serious, <laughs> serious trouble. Speaking of serious trouble, I think you are our guide out of that trouble. Jeff, thank you for this fantastic hour. You have been just a, a terrific, terrific guest. Um, how are, how are the many ways people can keep up with you? I mean, obviously they have to get your book, but yeah. you Twitter, the main route or, um... uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, um, Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm trying to f figure out Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you know, so, uh, so any of those channels, uh, you could sign up for my newsletter called next, uh, at jeffsalingo.com, uh, that I put out probably, I should put out more frequently, but put out about every other week. Um, and those are about the, about the ways, uh, uh, you know, I've been kind of in book, uh, as you know, Brian, you're, when you put out a book, you're kind of, you're buried deep in the, in, in that for, uh, for a little while. And now I'm starting to come out of that and starting to think about what's next. And your next project could take any number of forms. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeff. And no problem. It was great to be with you. And thank you for your, your great audience and, and their great questions. Well, this is a great community. Uh, thank you all. Uh, but don't go away yet. I just need to point out where we're headed for the next few weeks. And I mean that. Thank you all for really, really good questions throughout. Uh, for the next month or two, we're going to be diving into a whole set of subjects and everything from accrediting agencies and pedagogy, educational technology, work-life balance, augmented reality, a whole series of, uh, of approaches. You can keep talking about these issues uh, across all of social media, especially on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. Uh, we're always glad to keep this going. Uh, if you want to go into the past and look at the previous sessions where we've looked at a whole series of topics, including Jeff Slingo's first appearance in 2017, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And there's more than 220 videos there right now. Uh, and above all, uh, thank you again for a great hour this time. Um, I really wish you all the very best during this extraordinary semester. Please stay safe and we'll see you online next time. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>